We're going to solve this integral using the Feynman technique. The Feynman technique is a unique approach to integration that helps us eliminate one of our parameters using a partial derivative. This process should make our integral much easier to work with. The technique is fun, sexy, and oh so satisfying. All right, let's get started. So here's our integral in question. And if you were to try all these different techniques, you're going to find that you're not going to be able to solve it. And this is why Feynman's technique is just so beautiful. So we're going to go ahead and start off by rewriting a function f alpha is equal to the integral from zero to alpha. And we're going to go ahead and introduce something. We're going to go ahead and introduce an e to the negative alpha x. And in this case, what we have is a function that's now in terms of alpha. And the reason why we're doing this is so that something cancels out whenever we take this partial derivative. That is precisely why we like to use the Feynman technique. Check this out. We're going to go ahead and take the partial derivative of this particular function in terms of alpha. So let me just go ahead and write all this. And if you're not familiar with partial derivatives, that is OK. All you really have to know is that whenever we do take the derivative, it's almost like sort of like implicit differentiation. But what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and treat the x value as a constant. So in this case, we're trying to take the derivative in terms of alpha. So all the other uh, variables are just going to be treated as constants. So in this case, the sine x over x, there's really nothing to take the derivative of there because it's not in terms of alpha. So all I have is this constant sine x over x times the derivative of that value there. So let's go ahead and continue. On the left side, we have f prime of alpha. This is how we're going to keep that zero to alpha. And now we're going to have negative x e to the negative alpha x sine of x over x dx. Now, the reason why that works is remember, whenever we're taking the derivative, it's the original value. So e to the negative alpha x times the derivative of what's inside. Now, x is the constant in this case. So we're really taking the derivative of the alpha. So that's why we have a negative x on the outside. Now, let me just go ahead and create some more space here. And again, as I mentioned, this is precisely why we're using the Feynman technique, because what's going to happen is an x on the bottom and on the top is going to cancel out. That makes things so much easier. Because now we have an integral from zero to pi of negative e to the negative alpha x of sine of x dx. This is really nice. OK, it's still not something that we can solve right away, or I'm sure some people already know the solution to this. But again, it helps us eliminate that x factor. So let's go ahead and continue. We now we're working in terms of x because we already took care of that partial derivative. And we're going to go ahead and start integrating this in terms of x. Okay, so we're going to use integration on parts. We're going to make our u value the entire term outside of the sign. So negative e to the negative alpha x and du. Now we're differentiating in terms of x. So we're going to have an alpha positive alpha e to the negative alpha x. We have our dx and now we're going to make our dv the final term. So sine x dx and our v is going to be negative cosine x. Awesome. So let's continue. We have f prime of alpha is equal to uv. So that's going to be e to the negative alpha x cosine x. And don't forget, we're still differentiating this or integrating from zero to uh, infinity minus v du. So this is going to be minus integral from zero to infinity of v negative cosine x times du. So alpha e to the negative alpha x dx. I'm just going to go ahead and polish this up a little bit. As I do that, keep in mind that we can now figure out what these values are. Now, using the first one, fundamental theorem of calculus, when we plug in infinity in here, what we're going to have is e to the negative infinity. Now, e to the negative infinity that goes on the bottom, that's going to become zero, zero minus. Now, when you plug in zero in here, e to the zero is just one, but cosine of zero is also one. So we have minus one here. And now for the integral, I see that we have a, a couple negative signs. So these negative signs can sort of cancel out to make it a plus. And just because we're integrating in terms of X this time, I'm going to put the alpha on the outside. So I'm going to have plus alpha integral zero to infinity of E to the negative alpha X cosine of X DX. Okay. Looking good so far. Let me just rewrite this. And now what you're going to notice is we still have that integral. We haven't really cleaned that up uh, as much, but I don't know if you're familiar with uh, integration techniques that have an E and a cosine or an E and a trig function. Typically, you have to use integration wrap parts more than once. So in this in this case, that's exactly what we're going to do. So integration wrap parts one more time. U is equal to the thing again, E to the negative alpha X 
du is going to equal to negative alpha e to the negative alpha x dx. And we have our dv, which is cosine of x dx. And our v is going to be sine of x. I know you might think, well, we're kind of going backwards. And we sort of are, but it's going to really help us. Because now we have f prime of alpha is equal to negative 1 plus uv. So now we have e to the negative alpha x sine of x. But don't forget, we're integrating from 0 to infinity minus v du. So minus integral from 0 to alpha or 0 to infinity of sine x times negative alpha e to the negative alpha x dx. Now we're going to polish that up in a second. So what we have is f prime of alpha is equal to negative 1 plus let's go ahead and see and apply uh, the first fundamental theorem of calculus here. Once again, when you plug in infinity, especially into the e, you have e to the negative infinity. That's going to become zero. And then when you plug in zero into here, then you're going to get just zero. You can go ahead and kind of uh, do that on your own if you wanted to, but hopefully you believe me. Now, moving forward in that integral again, we have two negative signs. So I know I'm going to make that a plus and then check this out. Whoops, I realized there was a couple of things that I should have done here. One thing that you're going to notice that I missed is there was an alpha up on top of our entire integral. So what I need to do is sort of introduce an alpha uh, to everything. So I needed to have an alpha here and then I needed to have another alpha in this integral in this case. Okay, doesn't really change much because again, the, the first bounds, that's still going to be zero. So that's fine. But it's important to um, keep track of that alpha again because going back to our integral, we're going to have plus and then now you have two alphas. You have one here and one here. So now you're going to have alpha squared from zero to infinity of e to the negative alpha x sine of x dx. Okay. This is okay. This is actually really good. This is what we want. All right. Because we have f prime of alpha is equal to negative one plus alpha squared zero to infinity e to the negative alpha x sine of x dx. And I know, again, you might be thinking, well, we're going backwards. Yes, kind of. But this is going to really help us because, again, we recognize what that uh, integral is in the very beginning. When we differentiated in terms of alpha, when we took the partial derivative, we found the f prime of alpha. That's our f prime of alpha. Our f prime of alpha is negative e to the negative alpha x sine of x dx. So going back here, we basically have f prime of alpha. The only thing is that it doesn't have the negative sign. So this is going to be negative f prime of alpha. So what's that going to do? I have f prime of alpha is equal to negative 1 plus alpha squared times negative f prime of alpha. In other words, I can just do negative 1 minus alpha squared f prime of alpha. This should be a prime right here. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's just go ahead and add this to the other side. Makes our life uh, so much easier. And so now what we have is f prime of alpha plus alpha squared f prime of alpha is equal to negative 1. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and factor out an f prime of alpha from this. And we get 1 plus alpha squared is equal to negative 1. And let's go ahead and divide that 1 plus alpha squared to the other side. F prime of alpha is equal to negative 1 over 1 plus alpha squared. And this is why we did this. Because now we have F prime of alpha is equal to some value in terms of alpha, which is really nice. So guess what? Now we can go ahead and integrate in terms of alpha. So on the left side, we have F of alpha, which is basically almost the original function. And uh, on the right side, this is negative tan inverse of alpha plus our cheese. Okay, we can't forget the plus cheese because this is an indefinite integral. Awesome. So now we have to do something about that C. Okay, so we have to go back and explore our original function and see what we can gather, what sort of information we can gather so that we can solve for this value of C. So let me just kind of scroll up to the very beginning. Okay. So here's our f of alpha, and we're going to go ahead and examine some information. We're going to try to see what happens uh, as alpha equals something or it approaches something. So in this case, we're going to say what happens as what happens if we take the limit as alpha approaches infinity of f alpha. So on the uh, right side, we're going to have limit as alpha approaches infinity of integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative alpha x sine of x over x dx. Remember, this is alpha, okay? So what's gonna happen is alpha 
is going to go up on top here. We have negative infinity as the exponent. So we have e to the negative infinity, which is going to approach zero. So that means that the limit as alpha approaches infinity of f of alpha is going to equal to zero. That information is going to be really helpful. So let's go ahead and go back to our problem and keep in mind the limit for this was equal to zero. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay. So we have the limit as alpha approaches infinity of f alpha is equal to the limit as alpha approaches infinity of negative arctan of infinity plus c. Now we already know that on the left side that's equal to zero. On the right side, we have um, negative tan inverse of alpha. As alpha approaches infinity, you'll see that this is negative pi over two. I want you to think about that if you haven't uh, practiced your limits for arctan, but you can sort of graph this and you'll see that this is negative pi over two. Um, it's actually pi over two, but the negative is in the front, so it becomes negative pi over two. Now we go ahead and move the pi over two to the other side, and we have our constant is equal to this c. This is perfect because now we have f alpha is equal to negative tan inverse of alpha plus pi over two. Now we're almost done. Remember, f alpha was equal to the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative alpha x sine of x over x dx and it's equal to this right here now we're almost done except this was not our original integral this wasn't there so in this case we're going to make theta equal to zero so now we have zero to infinity e to the zero is just one so we have the original integral and now because we know alpha is equal to zero we have negative tan inverse of our alpha which is zero in this case plus pi over two. Now, once again, if you know your unit circle, if you know the graph of arctan, you'll see that this is equal to zero. So this integral zero to pi of sine x over x using the Feynman technique is pi over two. Now, just so you know, I will have a PDF of all my work here in the link or in the description below. So you can go ahead and grab that and enjoy it on your own. See you later, guys.